Hi, welcome to the DIY Biotech Writing Workshop. Today, we'll be writing in the code of life. Yeah, that's right, A's, C's, T's, and G's. Our project is to produce cinnamon compounds in yeast by integrating the genes that will make those compounds. If you're a little bit lost, you can watch the previous video somewhere up here or over there, maybe. Now, this isn't going to be like your high school to kill a mockingbird essay writing assignment. No, we'll need to very carefully design genes to move around and eventually integrate into our yeast. We'll identify the genes that we need, do codon optimization, perform Gibson assembly, and finally simulate how all of the genes will integrate and move around together. Welcome to DIY Biotech. CRISPR? I hardly know her. I mean, uh, clustered, regularly interspaced, short palindromic repeats, or CRISPR, is a bacterial defense system. CRISPR-Cas9 refers to a technology that uses the Cas9 enzyme to make specific cuts in a DNA sequence. It was discovered by Emmanuel Charpentier and Jennifer Doudna, who are both now Nobel laureates for their contributions. CRISPR-Cas9 uses a DNA barcode called a guide RNA that directs a Cas9 protein. This protein is what's called an endonuclease, meaning that it will cut both mated strands of DNA, a double-stranded break. In the case of our yeast, it doesn't really know how to repair this cut properly and usually ends up deleting or inserting random amounts of DNA. That is unless we feed the yeast a sequence that it thinks would fill the gap. If we feed the yeast our gene with sections of DNA on either end that line up with where Cas9 made the cut, it will incorporate this new gene. This process is known as homologous recombination. Okay, to be clear here, we aren't cloning as in making an identical copy. Cloning in genetic engineering often refers to cutting and pasting sections of DNA around, usually resulting in a plasmid. A plasmid is a circular piece of DNA that you can shove into an organism and it will read the plasmid like it's its own DNA. So the yeast and bacteria I work with are like little CD players and these plasmids are CDs. Oh, uh, a CD is a thin piece of plasmid. To build our plasmids, we typically use four tools. Restriction digests, ligation, polymerase chain reaction, and Gibson assembly. Restriction digests use restriction enzymes to cut at a particular site in a DNA sequence. Sort of like the CRISPR-Cas9 system, but way less flexible and much older. Ligation can seal two of the same restriction sites together. This is also a relatively old technology. Polymerase chain reaction, or PCR, uses short stretches of DNA called primers to amplify a region of interest. And finally, Gibson assembly, my personal favorite, uses overlapping sections of DNA to stick two or more sequences together. In my experience, Gibson assembly is pretty easy so long as everything has been designed properly. Let's plan out how all of our pieces of DNA will align. We'll be looking at the four tools we'll use in more detail in a moment, but first we need to understand how we're actually integrating the genes into Euroia to understand why we need to use the four tools in the first place. We'll be using what's called a dual plasmid transformation system. I'll put details to the paper that originally used this in Euroia in the comments below. The first plasmid that we're using is going to contain our Cas9 gene that encodes the Cas9 enzyme, as well as our guide RNA that will target a particular site in the genome. The second plasmid will contain our cinnamon gene with a promoter and a terminator to tell the organism to start reading this gene and then stop at the end. These little details are essential. And around this cinnamon gene, we'll also have homology arms so that our gene is actually integrated at the cut site. So we'll be putting both of these plasmids in Euroia at the same time, and to convince the yeast to keep both of these circular pieces of DNA, we need to have some motivation for the organism to use them to stay alive. And to do that, we use what's called oxytrophic markers. So the yeast will only be able to grow in our conditions 
if they contain our plasmid. So for our example here, we have a gene that encodes uracil on this plasmid and a gene that encodes leucine on this plasmid. Our particular strain of uroia cannot make leucine or uracil by itself. And so it must have these plasmids in order to grow in a media that contains everything that it needs except for leucine and uracil. So again, our yeast cannot produce leucine and uracil. It's in a media that doesn't have any leucine or uracil. And so in order to survive, it has to hold on to the two plasmids that contain the leucine and uracil genes. Now, as a small side note, Uroia doesn't have to keep these plasmids forever to express these genes. It only needs to keep them for a moment so that the CRISPR-Cas9 system can do its thing, make the cut, integrate the gene, and then we can cure or remove the plasmids from Uroia by growing it in non-selective media. And then it will just be the normal yeast again, just containing the cinnamon gene. So again, this is our final step here. And in order to do this, we need to build these plasmids. Fortunately, we already have these plasmids that contain our guide RNA and the Cas9 gene. We just need to build this plasmid that contains our particular cinnamon gene. So we have a plasmid that's really, really similar to this, but it contains a different gene that encodes green fluorescent protein or GFP. And we don't need that. We want to integrate cinnamon genes. And so that's what all of these four tools will be used for just to put our cinnamon genes in this particular plasmid. All right, so excuse my terrible drawing skills, but we'll actually see this in the computer in a moment. So it's gonna be really cool to see this terrible drawing come to life with actual DNA sequences in a moment. So like I mentioned previously, we already have this one plasmid that contains GFP. We need to get rid of our GFP gene and instead replace it with our cinnamon gene. In our case, we're able to actually print the cinnamon genes. It will cost about $2,000 to print all three genes, which, you know, in the grand scheme of things, isn't very much money. It's kind of interesting that you can just go online and order the genes that you want to be printed. However, we will have to do a little bit of work in a moment to find what the sequence of this gene is and then codon optimize it so that it can be expressed properly in Uroia. In a lot of cases, you aren't able to order the gene or it's more cost effective to use another tool like polymerase chain reaction or PCR to design some primers around a particular gene, extract a DNA sample from another organism that has that gene and just amplify it for it to be used in your final plasmid. So anyway, we have our two pieces of DNA, our one plasmid, we need to replace this gene, GFP, with our cinnamon gene and we need to put it in there somehow. First, let's get rid of our GFP gene. The easiest way to get rid of this GFP gene is to do a restriction digest. So there are short sequences, usually about six base pairs long, of what's called palindromic repeats. So they're the same one way as they are the other way. And particular restriction enzymes will cut in a different way at these different restriction sites. And there's sort of a a small enough amount of restriction sites that there's you know a few restriction sites scattered throughout this plasmid and in particular this plasmid was designed to have restriction sites around the gene so that you can easily cut out an old gene and put a new one in. So restriction digest is how we get rid of this GFP gene here. So now we need to fit our cinnamon gene into the gap that has been left behind in this lower plasmid. To do this, we make sure that we design our cinnamon gene with what's called Gibson assembly arms. So we want to have about 20 to 40 base pairs on either side of our cinnamon gene that overlap with local sections around where this GFP gene was. It's a lot like using homology arms in the CRISPR system where homologous recombination takes place but this can be used with smaller amounts of DNA and you only need 20 to 40 base pairs of overlap. Again, we'll see how we design these Gibson assembly arms in the computer in a moment. This plasmid is digested and this gene has Gibson assembly arms that overlap around where this GFP gene was. All we need to do is run the Gibson assembly reaction, which is really simple. You just mix a few things together and leave it at 50 degrees Celsius for an hour. And then on the other side, we should have our finished plasmid. So if you've been keeping up at home, we've only used two of the four tools that I mentioned previously. 
We could have used PCR to amplify this cinnamon gene from another organism, or we could have used PCR to amplify this entire backbone of the plasmid, excluding the GFP gene, but it's much easier to do it like this. We could have also used ligation here, so designed the cinnamon gene to have restriction sites on either end, made those cuts, and made sure those restriction sites were the same restriction sites as here, and then we could have used ligation instead to assemble this plasmid. Personally, I think Gibson assembly is much easier and works much better most of the time. Do it! Just do it! First, we need to find the genes that we need. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you can go back and watch the first video where I explain what genes we need to make cinnamon compounds in our yeast. Fortunately, we stand on the shoulders of giants. Another lab has already made cinnamon compounds in Saccharomyces yeast. They specify the genes we need here. For the purpose of this video, we'll just be designing the one gene, but the other two follow the same steps. Okay, so the first thing that you're going to want to do is find the paper that will tell you how to do everything. So in this case, we have a paper where researchers put the essential genes to produce cinnamon compounds in Saccharomyces. So use your university's VPN or something like Sci-Hub, Cough, Cough to do this. So if we scroll down to the methods, we can see it lists the gen bank numbers for the DNA sequence of this first ATPAL2 gene. So you can literally just copy this and put it in gen bank. The authors of this paper put gene bank and it's called gen bank, but you know, we'll give them a pass. <laughs> so we found the gene here in gen bank. It's an ammonia lyase. From gen bank, we can see the FASTA sequence. So this is the A's, C's, T's, and G's that we need here. We can just copy the sequence. The next thing we need to do is codon optimize. So we're ordering G block fragments from IDT. The organism that we're using to codon optimize is Euroia lipolitica. We can paste the sequence in here and optimize that sequence. Here is the result of the codon optimization. You know, Saccharomyces and Euroia are pretty closely related, so the differences may be kind of small here. We're going to start a new DNA file in SnapGene. So SnapGene is a fantastic tool for doing DNA manipulations, uh, and so that's what we're using here. We have the option to add some features, but we don't need those. So this is our gene in SnapGene. We can actually take this whole gene and translate it into the protein just so we can see the amino acid sequence in case we need it. So I'm adding a feature here, calling it ATPAL2 because that's the name of the gene. I'm making sure to translate this feature and I'm going to make it a pretty color. So it's important to see that there's a start codon ATG which encodes methionine and that there's a stop codon. In this case the stop codon is TAA. So here's our whole gene. Now we need to actually put this ATPAL2 gene into the plasmid that will help us integrate it into Euroia. This is the plasmid that I was talking about on the whiteboard. You can see the GFP gene right here. This is the gene we need to get rid of and replace with our ATPAL2 gene. The rest of the plasmid we don't need to worry about right now. The way that we'll cut this out is with two restriction sites, NHE1 and BSSH2. The I's are Roman numerals, so it's 1 and 2. So we can look at the sequence view. Like I mentioned, it's a very particular site that restriction sites cut at. And you can see that sequence here. It's just a few nucleic acids. Again, it's reverse palindromic repeat. So GC, 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 GC. That's where BSSH2 cuts. Now we need to add our Gibson assembly arms that will go on either end of our ATPAL2 gene that we'll order. Gibson assembly arms, usually you want to be about 20 to 30 base pairs long. We'll do 30 base pairs to be on the safe side. So I'm just gonna literally copy this section of DNA and paste it to the end of our ATPAL2 gene. We do need to keep the order in mind here. So this is the beginning of the gene, of the GFP gene. We're pasting it at the beginning of the ATPAL2 gene. We're just going to insert that fragment there. Literally just copying and pasting, just like a Word document. Now we need to do the other end. So the Gibson assembly arms need to be on either end. Here's the NHE1 restriction site. Again, just a very short nucleic acid sequence. It's a palindromic repeat again. GCTAGC, GCTAGC, 
So that's where NHE 1 cuts. Again, we need to take 30 base pairs for our Gibson assembly overlap. I'm just going to copy that again and paste it to the end of our ATPAL2 gene. And now that the Gibson assembly arms are there, we can order this gene and throw it into our digested backbone and run a Gibson assembly reaction and have that work out. So we need to actually simulate this in Snap Gene to make sure it works. This part is pretty important. Here's Gibson assembly. We're just inserting one fragment here. So insert fragment. And again, we can linearize with PCR, but this is a very big backbone. So that would be kind of hard to do. We're going to linearize with restriction enzymes. So again, we're using NHE1 and BSSH2. On this tab, Snap Gene is asking us which region we want to replace. So we need to make sure that we select the GFP gene and not the entire backbone. So really important, select the gene that we're trying to replace here because that's what Snap Gene wants us to do. Now we need to go to the fragment that we're going to insert. So we're going to the fragment tab. We're going to choose this untitled gene that I have yet to name, ATPAL2. And again, we could linearize this with PCR uh, if we're doing it from something else, but we already have the fragment, so we can just use the whole fragment. You can see the Gibson assembly is ready, and we can take a little peek at what our product will be. Here we have our ATPAL2 gene properly replaced in the plasmid, so we can go ahead and assemble that. Here's the plasmid. This is what we're going to build and eventually transform into Euroia. Now we need to make sure that we can confirm that this gene is integrated into Euroia. So we're opening this D17 site in Yali. This is the sequence within Euroia that I've found through a BLAST search. We can see our 1KB upstream and downstream homology arms. This is going to help with our homologous recombination that I've mentioned earlier. What this gene will look like in Euroia once it's inserted is literally just this section copied and pasted in between the two homology arms. Now, in real life, this is not going to be perfect, but for our purposes, this is a pretty good approximation of what's going to happen. This is what it will look like when we actually insert the ATPAL2 gene in Euroia. If the gene is inserted correctly, this is what the DNA sequence will be. So in order to confirm that this gene is integrated, we can do a simple PCR where we try to PCR amplify a section of this gene. And if it's present, then we know the gene is integrated. So we already have some primers designed here. This one is importantly outside of the homology arms and the melting temperature is 57 degrees Celsius. We need to keep that in mind. On the other side of this section of DNA, we have another primer, again, outside of the homology arms, that's also designed at a melting temperature of 57 degrees Celsius. When you design primers, you want the melting temperatures to be, you know, plus or minus three degrees Celsius about. So now we want to design a third primer that's going to go within the ATPAL2 gene. So if it's there, this primer will bind. If it's not there, the primer will not bind. So you always want to start your primers and end your primers with a GC pair. That's best case scenario. So I'm just going to highlight until we reach a TM of about 57. 58 is close enough. Go to primers, add primer, top strand, because the primer that we're amplifying this with on the other side, the other pair of this is a, is a reverse primer. So we're just going to call this int add primer to template. And now we can see that if we run a PCR reaction with these three primers, we're using three primers all at once, then if this gene is integrated, we will amplify this section, which is about 1.1 thousand base pairs, 1.1 KB is what we say. If the gene is not there, then that 1.1 KB fragment will not be amplified. And so this is a good way for us to find if this gene is integrated. Also, again, very importantly, these external primers are outside of the homology arms because if they were inside of the homology arms, we could potentially accidentally amplify a section of DNA that's already in our plasmid. So again, the sequence of the homology arms are in the plasmid that we're using, so we want to use primers that aren't in those homology arms in the plasmid. And our internal primer is within our ATPAL2 gene. So, you know, we're just making sure that we don't accidentally amplify 
the wrong thing. Potentially, this ATPAL2 gene is not integrated. So I'm gonna delete that here. This is what the Uroia DNA sequence will look like if it's not integrated. So again, if we're using this three primer system, we'll get a fragment of about 2.5 KB if the gene is not integrated. So if the gene is integrated, we sh should expect a 1.1 KB band. If it's not integrated, we should expect about a 2.5 KB band. So that was a little bit of a rush through the whole process. I do have sort of a live stream where I put together a really similar process that you can go check out on the channel. I'll, I'll try to put it uh, at this timestamp here. But I just wanted to briefly show sort of an overview of how everything is put together, how you find things, and how you can simulate these processes in the computer before you actually go into the lab. So in the next video, hopefully we'll actually be in the lab doing these things for real and not just in a computer. Hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe because it helps the channel grow. If you didn't, like, comment, and subscribe anyway because you're a good person. Thanks for watching. Bye. Wow. Move this whole desk outside just for a couple minutes of footage. At least I didn't have to put any shoes or pants on. <laughs>